ordinary wishful dreaming. Governments will never save the people. They exist to exploit and destroy the people. There is but one force that can save the people, and that is the people themselves. Anarchism. A century ago, the terrifying threat to world order. I suppose the standard image of the anarchist is somebody with a floppy hat, a large cloak, and either a violin case or a smoking bomb hidden behind a cape. You know, it's a, it's a musical caricature, but that's not what anarchism is. But who's an anarchist? Well, you know, women seeking women's rights, uh, working people see seeking workers' rights. I think it's an unquenchable spirit. For a few brief months in Catalonia, 1936, history's only anarchist experiment flourished. Esa revolución fue completamente diferente de las otras, porque nació de abajo del pueblo. And it was a woman from the far side of Europe who reported its rise and its final defeat to the world. English-speaking workers. Why are you sleeping while your Spanish brothers and sisters are being murdered? Where are your traditions? Speak. Act. Ethel MacDonald was born in Bells Hill west of Scotland in 1910, the free-spirited daughter of a large working-class family. A laird, a boss, a rich man, a thief, a paper, a drummer, a silly old thief. When I was young, I made a ten. When I was twa, I ran away. When I was three, I ran away. Okay, stop. There he is. 1914. The Great War begins killing 8 million men, women and children. 1917. Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. 1980. Women in Britain win the right to vote, but only for those over 30. All efforts at compromise between the Trade Union Council and the government regarding the position in the coal fields have failed. 1926. General strike across Britain. 1927, 20,000 stormtroopers march at the German Nazi Congress in Nuremberg. 1929, stock market crash in the United States triggers the Great Depression. 1931, the Spanish Republic is declared. King Alfonso leaves Spain. Barcelona, every town and hamlet. Fill the streets in one vast, delirious demonstration tonight to mark the birth of the Republic and their newly won. When I was eight, I was thinking straight. When I was nine, I could write all right. When I was ten, they gave me a pen. When I was young, I made a ten. When I was twelve, I ran away. This is the story of an extraordinary woman caught up in extraordinary times in a distant part of Europe where revolution was moving fast. Spain is the place where the future of the world has been determined. It's not just another little local difficulty. Spain was the place where fascism and democracy would finally meet face to face. At the age of 19, Ethel was seeking work. 
A star pupil at school, she, like most girls in the 1920s, left without qualifications. In the classroom, she was even more interested in politics than her lessons, joining the youth movement of the International Labour Party. Ethel was hardly alone in looking for a job. The Great Depression had Scotland and most of the developed world in its grip. British unemployment in 1933 exceeded three million. The women in Ethel's early life would have cooked and cleaned all day long for families of up to ten children. Many took part-time work to eke out their men folks' paltry wages, cooking and cleaning again for the families of the rich. Penniless and unemployed, Ethel was determined to escape that fate, even walking 70 miles in the hope of a job. Early in 1933, the Labour Exchange sent me after a job as a waitress at Dumfries. When I arrived, I found the whole thing was a fake, and I had to hitchhike back to Glasgow. This wasn't the first time Ethel had been enraged by management and bureaucracy. In every job she had found, she quickly challenged conditions and payment. Back in Glasgow, she went immediately to an advice centre run by well-known political campaigner Guy Aldred. You can't type, I suppose. Can't be that hard. Guy Aldrich was a very influential figure, I think. He was the editor of the anarchist uh, newspaper Freedom. He was somebody who, as a young man, had spent a little time with a whole range of different organisations until he settled and became uh, involved with the anarchist movement. Ethel and Guy Aldred clicked. He was dubbed by his supporters the guy they all dread for his fearless attacks on the state and employers. Perhaps we should start with my case. Ethel discovered anarchism and her political home for the next 30 years. Guy assembled a small team of activists in his advice centre. Good morning. They often gave the services free of charge to the poor in distress. As a result, they were poorer than those they held. Guy Aldred, the Knickerbocker rebel, gave impassioned speeches on Glasgow Green, in law courts, and on every street corner defending the rights of the working man. He learned to trade as political speaker and provocateur in the turbulent London politics of the 1910s and 20s, adding his voice to socialists and communists in the public arena. Hello, citizens, men and women. I am taking advantage of this event to draw your attention. Finding an affinity with Glasgow's radical working class, Aldred had no faith in Parliament representing the interests of the poor. The issue then was free speech. The top of every radical's agenda was what to do about the rapid rise of right-wing movements throughout Europe. In 1922, the black shirts marched on Rome. King Victor Emmanuel looked on, while the fascists seized control of all Italy. Mussolini had become Europe's first totalitarian dictator in 1926, outlawing other political parties. In the whirlpool of Europe's politics, the scum was coming to the top. Even here, the first germs of the disease. In Britain, Oswald Mosley organized the British Union of Fascists. From the beer cellars of Munich came a new voice. A leader was in search of a people, and a people was in search of a leader. In Germany, Hitler became Chancellor in 1936, immediately setting about rearming the country and creating the SS. Democrats and radicals alike, the spectre of fascism was terrifying, and they knew that a final terrible showdown with the extreme right was inevitable. Catholic Spain, dominated for years by dictatorships and backward-looking monarchs, 
was about to be thrown violently into the modern age. It seems almost incredible that those folks that cried, Viva el Rey, should soon be yelling, Down with the monarchy, death to the king, death to the queen, Viva la Republic. In 1931, the old monarchy had been overthrown and the new republic declared. Madrid, Barcelona, every town and hamlet filled the streets in one vast, delirious demonstration of delight to mark the birth of the Republic and their newly won liberties. But change was not quick enough or widespread enough for everyone. At the beginning of the 1930s, in Barcelona and everywhere else, women were paid half the meagre wages of men, less than two pesetas a day, often for precisely the same work. Arranged marriages were common, and unmarried women in a country heavily dominated by the church had to be accompanied by chaperones. But under the surface of everyday life, a new movement was taking shape in revolutionary bars and street corners. Soon, the events would change Spain more radically than anyone had anticipated. It wasn't Barcelona, though, but Oviedo, the capital of the mining province of Asturias, where the next crucial event was about to take place, as miners fought with government forces for control of the town. News from Oviedo spread like wildfire. Radical thinkers like Ethel MacDonald, now 27 years old, with eight years of anarchist activism behind her, quickly picked up on the importance of what was happening in Spain. In northern Spain, the miners had been united by the Workers' Alliance for over a year. With socialists, anarchists and communists participating, they determined resolutely to end the system of exploitation and arm themselves. In October 1934, a general strike was called. They came in thousands, attacked and overwhelmed Spanish government forces. The workers' flag flew over Oviedo and the town became a workers' commune. The right wing, Spain's royalist, traditional Catholics and conservatives, realized too where the Asturian rebellion might lead and didn't hesitate to brutally put it down. The minor strike was crushed, but the flame of revolution had been lit. Spain is in the grip of an election. All parties have made their appeal to the people, and Barcelona has good reason to be satisfied with the result, a clear victory for the parties of the left. Things begin to accelerate in February of 1936, when a Republican government is elected on the same program it had been elected on five years before. But five years before, it had failed to fulfill, fulfill most of its promises to bring about social change. It had promised land reform, and that had got diverted and not been fully implemented. It had promised trade union rights, and those rights had been driven back in the previous couple of years. It had promised secular education and limits on the power of the church. None of this had really been carried through. But elections in Spain don't blow over after a little mild cheering. Socialists and others, suppressed by the last government, no sooner hear the result than they start letting off steam. This time, the movement, the working class movement, the anarchist movements, the political movements, decided that they wouldn't wait for it all to go through the proper channels, for it to be legislated and carried through legally. Instead, the initiative now was seized from below. The Spanish Democratic Republic was caught in the middle of two opposing forces. The army and the monarchists were losing patience. Socialists and anarchists gaining confidence. People across Spain began to choose sides. Between the 18th and 20th of July, the Spanish military rebelled against the Republican government. Generals, including Franco, struck at all the major centers simultaneously. Civil war in all its naked horror invades the whole of Spain. Seville and Granada fell. Cities like Oviedo fought back or were defeated. But in Barcelona and Madrid and elsewhere, the rebel generals were repelled. Hitler and Mussolini supported the rebels with military aid. Britain and France adopted a policy of non-intervention banning the sale of arms to the Spanish government. So the Republic turned to Stalin's Russia for military assistance. Madrid enthusiastically hails the arrival of a diplomatic representative from Russia. 
Mr. Rosenberg is the first ambassador the Soviet government has sent to Spain. There are strong bonds of sympathy between Russia and the Spanish government. Communists believed in ridding the people of oppressive government, but only after the defeat of capitalism. Before then, there must be a disciplined dictatorship of the people, anathema to anarchists. And for communists, defense of the Russian revolution was paramount. The communist salute is used by everybody in Barcelona. And the government, though not communist itself, issues rifles to all who will defend it. Spain was now divided. About half the country in the right-wing army's control, the rest loyal to the Republic. The people of Barcelona took to the streets and built barricades, knowing full well they'd need to defend their city again. Days lengthen to weeks and still the burning, fighting, killing go on in the desperate battle for power. Radical thinkers and activists the world over were galvanized into action. Spain was the arena for the showdown between left and right. Help save Spain. For Ethel, that meant doing what she could locally. Join the workers in Spain. Writing, editing and distributing new sheets and calls to action. Spain? When the, the Civil War began, there was clearly a determined effort to very rapidly make it an international issue. People went all over Scotland, all over Britain, all over Europe, doing street meetings and so on, uh, to tell people about what was going on in Spain. In almost every major city, there were stalls and tables in, in shopping centres, uh, collecting money, getting people to sign petitions, and in some cases recruiting people for the international brigades. And uh, There were about 35 to 40,000 people who went from around the world, often under very difficult conditions, to fight in the international brigades. My father, James, joined the Communist Party in 1932, um, and he was watching what was happening in Spain with the miners in Asturias in 1933 and the various other events leading up to 1936. He was in the territorial army, so he had a rifle. And I think he came in one day, put his rifle down in the corner, never took his rifle with him which he might have wished he had done, because it probably worked better than anything he ever had when he was in Spain. But he just said, I'm going. He just decided he was going to go to Spain. He had, he had a duty to join international brigades and to go and fight for, this, for the Republic against Franco, against the fascists. Spain's atrocity-spangled civil war burns and butchers into its ninth week. Already it's estimated that 25,000 have been killed, but less than half of those have died on a battlefield. Night after night, all over Spain, men are torn from their weeping families, lined up and shot. André Prudemo, leading French anarchist, wrote to Guy Aldred from Barcelona, requesting an English-speaking journalist to inform the world of Catalonia's revolution. Well, we don't even have the funds for the bus journey out of town. Oh, what an opportunity. We've raised With her writing and propaganda skills, Ethel was an obvious choice. <laughs> Glasgow anarchists managed to raise funds to send her and her comrade, Jenny Patrick, to London where sympathizers raised money to get them to Paris. The initiative for the International Brigades was largely Communist Party. The Communist Party internationally mobilized the International Brigades in a series of meetings around the world. From Paris, sympathizers' generosity got us to Perpignan. From there, we walked, hitchhiked, and nearly starved our way to Barcelona. The anarchists also had their own network, and in fact, they often, if you like, went by different underground railways and arrived by different routes. Come on. It was difficult because, for example, Britain and France were involved in non-intervention, and therefore it was actually, strictly speaking, illegal to go to Spain. There are people going to Spain who are virtually penniless. I mean, virtually penniless, and, and they're not giving up jobs to go to Spain, but they don't have degrees, and they're not journalists, and they're not tourists, and they're not travellers. My father talks about the journey about leaving from George Square um, and double-decker buses um, and going down, and the, the, on the journey they seemed to have been well treated and things worked out okay until they got there. They did six weeks training and then thrown straight into battle. 
literally the, the back of the truck opened and out and that was them in the battle and it was just absolute um, chaos and really quite disorganised but I think it was a different kind of fighting I mean the Spanish Civil War you have to think that there was something like Guernica which was like Fallujah, the flattening of a place and, and that kind of bombing that was something that was part of a very modern warfare on the one hand on the other hand you had I think the last cavalry charge in a modern military history The battle between Republicans and right-wing rebels hadn't reached Barcelona yet. In that city, a whole new way of living was being explored. Especially in Barcelona's old town, the epicenter of the anarchist movement. The Raval in Barcelona was, from the early 1920s onwards, and even before that, an area from which immigrants came, immigrant workers came from the rest of Spain. They tended to be illiterate, they tended to be very poor, but it was precisely there that the anarchists organized, organized education, organized community organizations and so on. And really, that was their base. Llegué a Barcelona del año 34. No participé en, antes del 36 en ningún grupo uh, anarquista. Quería, quería. Lo que sí participaba era, con mi padre, en todos los mítines, ¿no? Entonces allí se reunía, yo dije, la, las plazas de las plazas de toros, la monumental y tal, estaba negra de gente, negra. The Café La Fragua was a kind of typical restaurant for working class people. Long tables, simple furniture, basic food, cheap and available, lots of noise, lots of debate, lots of discussion. So this is Barcelona. This is Barcelona where there's a, a power on the ground, there are organizations, the streets are controlled by people's militias, the factories are controlled by workers' committees. There is a real new kind of power emerging in Barcelona, a workers' power. Instructions from above, from the government, were no longer simply accepted. Even simple requests for curfew, for example, would be debated, overruled. Ja ho sabem, camarada, però no esperem ordres de l'alt. Sabem el que passa. Els carrers estan organitzats i la gent sap el que ha de fer. The people felt they had the power. The fundamental anarchist principle is you should always challenge authority. Uh, and if it can't justify itself, which is usually the case, uh, then you should work dismantling it and creating a freer and more libertarian relationship among people. Nosotros defendimos al concepto humanista, a la lealtad, a la honestidad, a los principios que fueron básicos del anarquismo, de sacrificio más que de lucro. En fin de cuentas, de lo que se trata es de abrir brecha, de no someterse, de ser dignos, de ser hombre, de luchar por nuestra propia dignidad. Lo que aporte o no aporte, los que sigan o no sigan, pero yo creo que es la, la misión del hombre como la mujer, ¿no? De defender su dignidad, su derecho a ser, su libertad, colectiva e individualmente. It looks from the outside as if there was a spontaneous anarchist revolution in 1936, but it's really misleading. There was a long preparatory period just in the general population, in which the ideas, assumptions, the conceptions of how to run a more free society just became instilled in people. Um, I was told to report here. Who is Andre Prudemont, is that me? Ethel had arrived in the most exciting place on earth at the time. For ten extraordinary months in 36 and 37, the region of Catalonia became the center of one of the most radical revolutions in world history. Some three million men, women and children were involved. In the countryside, 
Surrounding Barcelona, peasants formed communes on land confiscated from the old ruling elite. Workers took over the factories. Police were replaced with civilian self-defense forces. In Catalonia, three quarters of the economy was under anarchist control. Hotels, shops, barber shops and restaurants were collectivized and managed by their workers, often making them more efficient. La calle, en la calle Villa Donat y Gran Vía de un antiguo convento y ahí se hizo, en, primero dice Universidad Popular y luego quedó en el Instituto Libre. From each according to his ability to each according to his needs was put into practice. In some communes money was entirely eliminated and replaced with vouchers and bartering schemes. A partir del moment que la revolució s'extén per Catalunya, en algunes de les zones catalanes, al centre o a la, o a la zona costera, hi ha algunes col·lectivitzacions en mans d'anarquistes de, de que sí que deixaran d'utilitzar la moneda corrent i que eh, faran un altre tipus de moneda o fins i tot utilitzaran el sistema de l'intercanvi. Però bàsicament aquest tipus de substitució de moneda per l'intercanvi és més un mite que una realitat que s'estén per tota la Catalunya revolucionària de l'any 36. Per tant, la moneda continua utilitzant-se i sí que és veritat que a vegades entre unes col·lectivitzacions i unes altres s'intercanvien els productes. A una li sobrava, per exemple, blat i a l'altra, en canvi, tenia un excedent de vi. Every facet of life was being experimented with. It was an extremely successful, maybe the most successful uh, case of people actually taking their lives into their own hands, uh, running it successfully, very poor people. I mean, I remember as a child uh, back in the 19, you know, around 1940, when I was just learning about these things, reading the uh, documents of the collectives, and some of them were very moving. Uh, there was one in particular a village called Membria, which describes itself as... These are just documents put together by peasants and workers in different places. It's, they describe it as uh, the poorest village in Spain, but the most just. Barcelona is a marvelous place in its architecture. The buildings are really wonderful, each one gleaming brightly and not a trace of soot or grime. In the main square, the Plaza de la Repubblica, the white walls of the Generalitat, the government offices, glisten in brilliant sunshine. Birds are singing in the trees, and the sky is the most beautiful blue I've ever seen. Civilian soldiers dressed in their inevitable dungarees and little red and black Langari bonnets and smoking endless cigarettes strolled casually in Las Ramblas or chatted to the girl soldiers in the Plaza Catalunya. Y yo creo que recuerdo que las chicas de donde yo trabajaba tuvieron la ocurrencia de comprarse, porque nadie los llevaba, de comprarse unos sombreros y venir a trabajar con sombreros, porque entonces solamente los llamaban las burguesas, ¿no? Las chicas bien. Y entonces tuvieron la ocurrencia porque nadie compraba, compraba sombreros, ¿no? Entonces, sí, aquello fue un gran cambio. This new confidence, this thirst for change came as a reaction to years of repression. Yo recuerdo que había una muchacha muy bien arregladita, muy todo eso, y a mí me extrañó enormemente porque esta chica no sabía leer, no había ido a la escuela. Entonces yo me, me extrañaba, ¿no?, que una chica de mi edad y todo eso, de que no tuviera ni siquiera esos conocimientos elementales. Women's lives changed radically. The Republican government had improved things in allowing divorce in exceptional circumstances, but anarchist women wanted more. In 1936, they founded their own pressure group, Mujeres Libres, Free Women. Yo creía que era una cuestión de mujeres mayores, de 30 años para arriba. Entonces yo no llegué, sí conocí algunas que estaban en Mujeres Libres, pero es que tampoco me hablaron ni me hicieron, ¿quieres apuntarte? No tenía ni el pur, ni pur, ni contra, ¿eh? Luego ha sido cuando yo, que compraba el, el periódico y la revista, ¿eh? luego yo le he dado toda la, la importancia que aquello tuvo. For the first time in Spanish history, women had a real say, politically, economically, and in the home. The Spanish term, for example, mi mujer, meaning my wife, but literally my woman, was immediately replaced by mi compañera, comrade. 
había un verbo que se popularizó, fraternizar. Fraternizar, aquello era la, la cuestión de fraternizar. La, los primeros días, desde luego, fue algo magnífico. Tú. Mujeres Libres number 30,000 women at its height. They set up a women's college in Barcelona, which by 1938 was taking in 600 to 800 female students per day. Y lo que querían, sobre todo, es cultivarla y prepararla para que tuviera un rol en la sociedad. Porque si tú eres una mujer, eres una, ante todo una individualidad, ¿comprendes? Entonces tienes derecho a, a, a escoger la vida. No estás condenada, no estás condenada a estar en el hogar, ni estás condenada a ser madre, ni está, estás sobre todo el derecho de ser tú misma, lo que tú quieras ser, ¿no? They opened paternity hospitals and schools and organized military training. There were, particularly among the anarchists, very fine, very combative women militias. And, um, and Ethel went into that world where she would have met people like her, young working class women who were involved in a fight for workers' power and a fight against fascism. I had difficulty deciding which soldiers were young men and which were girls. They were dressed exactly alike, but as we drew nearer, we saw that all the girls had beautifully permed hair and were strikingly made up. Through the streets, naked murder is stalking. The ever-present spectre in a country divided against itself. In the rising of fascists against the government, brother raises his rifle against brother. Seville, Saragossa, San Sebastian, from all these places known so well to holidaymakers in times of peace, Pictures unfold the cataclysm that has taken toll already of 20,000 lives. In Spain, as in the wider world, stories of violence attributed to anarchists made the headlines more often than the revolutionary experiments. For many anarchists, non-violence is central to their cause. However, there can be no doubt that in the prelude to and during the Civil War, hundreds of churches throughout Spain were attacked and burned. As many as 700 priests in Catalonia were killed. Some of these atrocities must be blamed on anarchists, but there are many groups involved with the rebellion against conservative Spain. Trotskyites, communists, and the right wing themselves, seeking to vilify anarchists and the republic generally. At the early stages of the Spanish anarchist revolution, there were uh, acts of violence, so like killing of priests, for example, burning down of churches and so on, which were um, unconscionable, but were a reaction of very oppressed people to uh, highly oppressive institutions which had been crushing them for centuries. And when people liberate themselves, unpleasant things happen. Uh, anarchism is not a doctrine. Uh, nobody lay down the dogma. I, I think it should best be looked at as a, a kind of a tendency in uh, human thought and human action and human affairs, a tendency which is certainly based on principles. Uh, the fundamental principle is that uh, uh, authority is not self-legitimating. Our cameraman is on the spot, securing the first sound film interview in the trenches. We are here three miles from the capital of Spain. The town is under our eyes. The Spanish Civil War was the first truly media war of the modern age. Radio film and poster art were all brought into play. The walls of the city, said one observer, became an anti-fascist art gallery. Ethel took no time settling in. From the moment she arrived, she recorded, commented on, explained events in Spain generally, and Barcelona specifically. She sent her articles home to Guy Aldred to print in news sheets and pamphlets. Our victory is sure, because the Spanish proletariat has the will to conquer. The almost superhuman determination of the workers on July 19th 
When they destroyed, without any preparation, the whole fascist army in Catalonia, will be repeated on the fronts of Andalusia and Aragon. From our cameraman in the vital northeast sector of the Spanish war front comes news that is no less important than the attack on the capital. For with the world's spotlights on the fight round Madrid, we're apt to forget that Catalonia and its capital Barcelona are by no means conquered. Day after day, along a hundred mile front, these men hold the lines against fierce attacks by forces of Moors, used by General Franco as his main spearhead. Atho knew this war wasn't simply a war between left and right, between the democratically elected republic and the military. There were divisions opening on the left itself. She was an anarchist through and through. The coalition between Democrats, Communists and Anarchists was of less interest to her than the defence of the revolution. She was at pains to distinguish right from the beginning the difference between Anarchist and Communist positions. The Spanish worker wants the assistance of the world proletariat to end once and for all class differences and exploitation. According to the Communist Santiago Carrillo, we are fighting for a democratic republic, for a democratic and parliamentary republic. It should be clearly understood that we, the anarchists, are not fighting for the democratic republic. We are fighting for the triumph of the proletarian revolution. The revolution and the war are inseparable. Without your British government's consent, these troops could never have been brought across the Mediterranean. Without your apathy, the Moorish troops would never have entered Spain. The anarchists were organized around the CNT, the National Workers' Confederation, the largest trade union in Catalonia. From within the CNT, the Iberian Anarchist Federation, the FI, operated the political and campaigning arm of the movement. At this early stage, anarchists and communists were still working together, but the ideological and political differences were profound. At the start of the war, the Communist Party was very small probably had 3,000 members or so, compared with the hundreds of thousands who were in one way or another led by or influenced by the anarchists. They were small, but because they, if you like, because of the international connection, because of their connection with Russia, they had, if you like, a, an authority or a possible weight greater than their numbers. And therefore they went to the Republican government and offered their support, and in doing so, Really, they were kind of deploying the, the promise of, of, of Russian support, too. Ethel wrote about everything. The progress of the front line, almost within hearing distance. The tensions between the factions. The work done in collectivized villages and factories. Living and working in a city on edge, waiting for a attack at any moment, was a rich source of material. The lights went out throughout the city. From the tops of the buildings, huge beams played across the sky, searching, searching. All the subways have display notices advising the people to take shelter. Hurrying to and fro were the militia, armed. It was marvellous. It reveals wonderful determination. The 15th International Brigade was where the majority of volunteers were placed. 40,000 people worldwide came to fight in Spain, over 2,000 British quarter of them Scots. Barcelona, November 10, 1936. This evening we went to a meeting of the French and German sections. This place is full of people of all nationalities. Most of them are about 25 to 30 years old. Romanians, Bulgarians, Russians, Germans. This is the kind of international that will unite the human race. I hope I can pick up Spanish so that I can get a thorough knowledge of the international movement. All I can say is dos cafes con leche and salud. Everyone says that Spanish is simple. But to me, the pronunciation is like committing suicide. I almost trip over each word. 
Nothing depresses me so much as the fact that I don't understand what's being said and I'm unable to ask exactly what I want. It gives me an inferiority complex. All languages are spoken here, but those who understand English are few and far between. <laughs> Truly, I should feel cheated if I was to leave Spain with nothing attempted and nothing done. I feel my future depends on making good here. <laughs> I shall do great things when I'm back in Britain, but I want to achieve something here first. Ethel's journalistic and propaganda skills had been noticed. She was recognized as the right voice for Barcelona's anarchist radio station. Radio was the new and compelling media of the day and fast becoming an important weapon in Spain's ideological struggle. As soon as Franco's rebels attacked, they began broadcasting propaganda, war news, claims of victory and other military information for public consumption. Every radio station was directly controlled by either the rebels or loyalists solely for the dissemination of propaganda. In Catalonia, the radio station was a crucial medium for volunteers from every country. English being the one language many of them had any knowledge of other than their own. Dos, uno, dentro. Yesterday I went to a small place outside Barcelona called Sabadell. A group of young comrades have taken over a house and there they have a school for mutual instruction. The FBI headquarters in Sabadell are in the north. I think it's an interesting thing to look at the huge importance that radio had and radio voices and how enormously significant they were in, in building morale and mobilizing people for the for the resistance to fascism in Spain. They have definite ideas of action, not mere theory. Barcelona was the center of the revolutionary resistance and her voice, her daily broadcast as part of the, you know, of the kind of propaganda and political machine of the anarchists will have been important. Of course, the best-known radio voice of all was La Passionaria, you know, with her No Pasarán slogan. Her, she spoke almost every day on the radio and became well-known in Spain and beyond. Strange, really, because, you know, in a sense, these, both these women came from similar backgrounds, working-class backgrounds, from kind of industrial areas. Very different, and yet, in a curious way, kind of occupying uh, parallel roles, maybe, in Spain. Are you English-speaking workers prepared to let this tragic force, which means the rape of Spain, go on? If you are men and women, if you sense the class struggle, you will permit no ban on volunteers. Spain wants action. Action by the great democracy in every democratic country. Action at home to defeat fascism, to aid the struggle of anti-fascist Spain. The English language is held by those who speak it to be the greatest language of freedom. To all who believe, therefore the best of the English tongue, who hear it ringing in the accents of the martyrs, and not the callous, cynical tones of the persecutor and the judge, I address myself. I ask you again to make it the language of freedom. Let it vie with the Spanish tongue and the tongue of one-time revolutionary France. Let it speak to fascism, to Hitler, to Mussolini and to Franco. Let the voice of the people of England, the voice of strangled freedom, be heard. In the wider world beyond, the radio brought living news of the momentous happenings in Spain. Her broadcast reached as far afield as the USA. The common people of Spain sometimes battled with only their bare fists and walked heroically to their deaths to vanquish fascism. The ill-equipped and betrayed people were winning, so fascist Portugal, fascist Italy, fascist Germany stepped in, whilst France and Britain, especially Britain, played a democracy. Played a democracy, spoke non-intervention, and behind non-intervention, assisted fascism and Franco. 
A prominent news editor in California reported that he had received hundreds of letters about Ethel McDonald because she had the best radio voice he had ever heard. The Spanish government has been forced to flee from Madrid to Valencia. That, on the 114th day of the terrible civil war, was the news from Spain. And pouring into Valencia, too, come Madrid's children, speeding from the continuous danger of bombardment that hangs over the capital. As the fascist insurgency gained strength, tensions began to rise amongst those defending the Republic. On November the 14th, Buenaventura Duruti, a leading anarchist, returned from the Aragonese front, where he commanded a force of 5,000, the legendary Duruti Column. Ethel reported his sudden and mysterious death on the 19th of November, 1936. I was at the internment. The streets of Barcelona were packed. Duruti's dynamic integrity is a serious loss to the workers' struggle. Except for the fact that liberty does survive the death of its prophets and its warriors, one would wonder what would come of such a loss. His body rested all night in the hall of our headquarters. We honour his memory and the uniqueness of his energy and courage combined. Duruti was shot either by a sniper or accidentally by his own pistol. But in the heightened atmosphere of Barcelona at the time, his death provoked further division and rumour, even amongst anarchists themselves. Sobre la mort de Durruti hi ha encara una sèrie d'hipòtesis obertes. En concret n'hi ha tres. Una és que el van matar els propis anarquistes, sobretot els anarquistes més radicals, contraris, a que la CNT fa i formessin part dels governs. Una segona interpretació és que va ser assassinat pels comunistes, és a dir, pels que deien els contres revolucionaris. I la tercera és que se li va disparar la seva pistoleta, que duia sempre penjada. The disagreements between the various Republican factions was becoming a problem. Anarchist leaders felt they needed to take action. With the fascist threat coming ever closer, the Madrid and Barcelona headquarters would soon be involved in fighting. Bé, els anarquistes durant aquells moments, a setembre del 36, estan rebent de part dels comunistes com una pluja enorme de pita. És a dir, tant els diuen que són uns salvatges, que són uns incontrolats, que perderem la guerra per culpa dels anarquistes. Tota aquesta unió de coses i de forces fa que els dirigents anarquistes considerin que és necessari entrar en els governs. Intervenir en el govern significa anar en contra dels principis anarquistes, que no són, estan en contra de la política, en contra de l'Estat. Amb el report que Madrid és gairebé completament surrounded per General Franco's army, el centre de govern de l'Espanya a Espanya és a Barcelona, probablement l'única ciutat que no està immediatament threatened per atac. The relative peace that had allowed the Catalan experiment that Ethel had found so fascinating was nearing its end. There is trouble in Barcelona. At 3 p.m. on May 5th, three lorry loads of police made use of the siesta hour to launch an attack on the telephone exchange. They seized the ground floor without difficulty, but our comrades in the building barricaded the stairways and swept them with machine gun fire. The attack in May 1937 on the anarchist stronghold, the telephone exchange, came not from the fascists, but from the communist-backed government. For Stalin, and for the communist movement worldwide, the key and prevailing concern was that, that there could be political alliances and understanding between Russia on the one hand, and France and Britain, above all Britain on the other, because Hitler was threatening Russia. So Stalin's vision of what was going on in Spain had less to do with Spain than the broader European situation in which it became critical that Britain would support Stalin against Hitler. Crowds gathered outside the building and the streets were filled with men and women crying, to the barricades, to the barricades. The police had used sandbags and bricks intended to repel Franco's attack, but our anarchist comrades tore up loose paving stones to build their own barricades. At that stage, the dominant element in the power system of the Republic was communist, or close to communist. And they hated the anarchists with an absolute passion. And uh, they simply used their power to crush the uh, Barcelona working classes and the anarchist movement with quite a lot of violence. There was electricity in the air. All during the night there was firing in the street. We had a good view from our window. 
They wanted us to stay inside, but we left the building and made our way to the CNT headquarters. It begins with an argument about whether to have an, a May Day demonstration, and then on the 3rd of May, the head of security in the Catalan government and the Home Secretary in that government send troops to the telephone exchange in the Plaza de Catalunya in central Barcelona to drive out the trade unions who at that time are controlling the telephone exchange. The firing became terrific. The police were firing from their building in nearby houses and the CNT were applying from inside their headquarters at the telephone exchange which the anarchists had occupied. The gunfire crossed from the balconies over the Plaza Catalunya, from the Cologne Hotel, the Socialist Party HQ. The noise is terrible. Already many have been killed and wounded. In a sense, the telephone exchange was very symbolic. The telephone exchange was run by the workers in the telephone exchange. And the argument was that they listened in to ministerial conversations. Now, you can imagine what mayhem that could cause if you actually heard what politicians say to each other. But more importantly than that, that was symbolic, really, of the extent to which workers' organizations still controlled things. So sending troops against the workers was a demonstration to the outside world that they would not allow a revolution to happen in Spain with all the consequent repercussions with the rest of Europe. But there is another way to manera de valorar el que va significar els fets de maig, i és que les minories més radicalitzades de la CNTFAI suposaven a la direcció de la CNTFAI i a la política que havien fet de col·laboració amb els governs. Per tant, tenim davant de nostra diverses possibilitats: un punts comunista, un punts dels republicans o bé les pròpies minories radicalitzades anarquistes que suposen els seus dirigents. But for the ordinary soldier, the political divisions weren't necessarily so obvious. Or clear cut. The interesting thing is, I've never heard my father say anything about, you know, judging whether anarchists, Pum, the socialists, and so on, were right or wrong. I mean, I think he was a member of the Communist Party, but he went there to fight Franco, and he went there because he did see this as a dress rehearsal for a greater, a larger a, a struggle. In the taller where I worked, comprend? No había problema porque unos se dieron de lo que de y tal y cual. Es que no me sentí, es que no hubo problema en el seno del comité de control por el hecho de pertenecer a una organización u otra. In the midst of the street fighting, Ethel managed on May the 8th to get out one last dispatch from Barcelona. She sent it to Aldred, who published it in the Barcelona Bulletin on the 15th of May. We were preparing for attack. Men barricaded windows. Women dragged out cases of ammunition. Machine guns were mounted. We knew what was coming. I set out at seven. At that hour, Spanish women go to the market. Both sides knowing this, look out for them and cease fire to allow them to move about. We mingled with these women, some of whom carried little white flags in their hands. We would slink along a street, hugging a wall. Sometimes firing went on above our heads, aimed at the windows, showers of plaster falling about our ears. This way, we eventually reached the Via de Ruti. We chatted with a comrade while we waited for a lull in the fighting. Five minutes later, we saw him fall. This was our life for the next three days. We busied ourselves filling cartridges for the soldiers and preparing food for them. At mealtimes we felt that all the food was needed for them, and we had our meals in a little restaurant a few streets away that had remained open for us. At the barricades we watched the soldiers and police drag easy chairs out of nearby buildings and sit smoking till it was time to start firing again. They seemed to take things as coolly as that. We saw 12 comrades dragged from their car and shot. When the ambulance people tried to get to them, they were ordered back and told if they went to these men, they would be fired upon. Our comrades did not want to kill people and they withheld the fire as much as possible, contenting themselves with defence. Dead and wounded lay between the barricades, wrecked cars in every other street. Hardly a pane of glass was left in a window. All the street lamps were shattered. Walls were wrecked by bombs. As soon as the fighting stopped, wives and mothers hurried through the streets searching for their loved ones. The streets were filled with fear-stricken and frenzied women. 
partir del 6 de maig el que sí que queda clar és que la CNTFAI ja no formarà part fins al final de la guerra en els governs ni de la Generalitat ni a Madrid, però també significarà per als militants més radicals de la CNTFAI un període molt negre. És el període d'empresonament, és el període d'assassinats, és el període de reclusió de 3.700 anarquistes en les presons i en els camps de treball que s'instal·len a Catalunya durant aquest període. Per tant, entrem en una etapa molt dura, molt dura, pels propis anarquistes. La conspiració ja venia de lejos, y, ya, y no eran solamente los comunistas, eran también, comprendéis, todos eh, eh, que, estaban, que querían terminar con el PUM y querían terminar también con la CNT. Acabaron, bueno, sí, con la revolución. Por cuatro días hay una lucha, al final de la cual los revolucionarios, los más radicales, los más determinados luchadores contra el fascismo, son arrestados por sus primeros aliados y colegas, en algunos casos en algunos casos torturados, en algunos casos matados. After the events of May 36, Ethel's voice was no longer heard on the airwaves, nor was there any news of what had become of her. A mesura que la guerra es va perdent, a mesura en que cada vegada més la república depèn del subministrament d'armament que procedeix, que ve de Moscou, la justícia republicana i la rereguarda republicana es militaritza. Què vol dir això? Vol dir que la república, davant d'aquesta situació tan tensa, el que fa és militaritzar tots els elements, és a dir, des de la justícia, passant pels tribunals, passant per les lleis, etc. I per tant la justícia passa a ser una justícia molt arbitrària. És a dir, els processos que es fan, aquí se'n diuen fotomaton, de justícia ràpida i expeditiva, i moltíssima gent anirà a parar a les presons i els camps de treball que s'instal·len sense les més mínimes garanties processals ni legals. Why they didn't arrest me immediately and have done with it, I couldn't work out. Later I discovered that they had already arrested so many British subjects that they were afraid to arrest me. Apart from making representations for other prisoners to the authorities, who hated me, there was little I could do. On several, on several occasions, the assault guards raided the cafe looking for armed revolutionaries. I passed myself off as a wife of one or other of the men. It was nerve-wracking. On one occasion, a young lad slipped me two bombs and a kind of flatjack. The guards searched everyone, but missed me. While Ethel hid out in Catalonia trying to find a way to get home, she was becoming famous in her native land. The mystery of what had happened to the Scots girl anarchist was picked up by the press, and as a result, anxiety grew in Britain and abroad. There were rumors that she was in jail, that she was being tortured, that she was dead. One night, at about one o'clock, there was a thunderous knocking at the door. Assault guards marched in and, without a word of explanation, ransacked every corner and every cupboard. Eventually, they took me to the police station and left me there all night. The next morning, I was moved to the Hotel Falcon, which had become a prison for anarchist soldiers. They took me in a motor lorry that, for all the world, was like the tumbrel of the French Revolution. They wanted me to sign some document, but I refused. My fingerprints were taken and no charges were prepared against me. The fate of volunteers missing in Spain attracted international criticism. In Spanish law, charges against prisoners must be laid within 30 days. In practice, they were locked up indefinitely. But the day finally arrived when the authorities decided to charge Ethel formally. 1. Found in possession of foreign money. 2. I was a fascist, because files on my possession had formerly belonged to a fascist. Actually, I'd found them in the CNT and merely made use of them. Three, associating with prisoners and conspiring with them in a foreign tongue. Now that she had been formally arrested, Fenner Brockway, a leading member of the British Labour Party, managed to have charges against her lifted. 
Fener Brockway es trasllada al que és la presó en aquells moments on estan concentrats 150 persones. Aquesta presó estava situada exactament aquí, aquí de davant, i era l'antiga seu del PUM al capdavall de la Rambla de Barcelona. Quan entra Fener Brockway es queda absolutament esturat, perquè es troba amb 150 persones en una situació molt precària. Només hi ha un lavabo, només hi ha una pica per rentar-se les mans, a més a més només els hi reparteixen dos menjars que són sopa i un trosset de pa al dia, hi ha moltíssima gent molt malalta, amb polls, amb una situació absolutament desastrosa. I sobretot pels brigadistes internacionals, que aproximadament n'hi havia uns 30, i que no tenen cap suport de les famílies que hi havia a Barcelona. Citizens escaping the fighting south and west of Barcelona were flooding through Catalonia to get to the safety of France. The Republican Guard checked their papers at the border, so Ethel needed a visa to leave the country. The British consul told me that friends in Britain and America were preparing for my being allowed to leave the country. But I couldn't do that until I got a pass, and if I tried to get one, it would be an excuse for my arrest. Ethel didn't leave the country immediately after her release. She felt there was still work for her to do in Barcelona, helping anarchist comrades escape. The Republican reporter now found herself working against the Republic's oppression. Under the noses of the communist-controlled police, I helped anarchist comrades in and out of prison. Some soldiers managed to escape altogether, disguising themselves in clothes borrowed from civilians. We approached the crew of foreign ships to beg secret passage for wanted men and women in danger. When these activities became known, the British press dubbed Ethel the Scot Scarlet Pimpernel. She managed to get a letter back to Aldred and Jenny, her anarchist travelling companion who had got out of Spain before the crackdown. Dear Guy, I know you've been expecting to hear from me sooner than now. I'm still here, but unable I'm in hiding. I can't get a visa. If I apply, I'll be arrested. If I don't, I'll be arrested. I can only leave the country with the help of comrades, but most of the people I knew here left for their own countries, and sometimes it's pretty lonely. Conditions in prison were bad, but we kept up the struggle. We managed to persuade everyone in every prison to strike at a certain hour on a certain day. I used to collect packets of letters from the other prisoners and smuggle them out with my own, in the cans which were brought to us in prison. The cans, thanks to careful planning, always landed in the hands of the same man who knew what to do with them. Everything was cut and dried. Street plans were prepared and everyone knew, if they escaped, exactly what to do and where to go. The letters and arrangements for those going abroad were handed to a French skipper. I'm still here but unable to leave the country legally. I am a terrible sight. I have lost everything. I need your help and solidarity. Please do not fail me. Not that I am afraid, but I would be foolish if I didn't know the danger I am in. Beyond the prisons, the civil war itself was going badly. The Republic was losing ground to a far better organized rebel army. Britain, although still not taking sides, was increasingly worried about the safety of its nationals in Spain. Barcelona becomes the storm center as General Franco's threat to bombard the city leads our government to take steps to ensure the safety of British citizens. That safety will now be provided by the formation of a neutral zone south of the harbor. At the docks I was questioned, but after a few minutes they allowed me to pass. I was never so thankful in my life. After almost a year, Ethel fled the country she had longed to help. Truly, I should feel cheated if I was to leave Spain with nothing attempted and nothing done. I feel my future depends on making good here. The French town of Le Pertu on the Spanish border comes an unending stream. 
For days they have been trudging along rock-strewn tracks over the snow-capped Pyrenees. Leaving Spain behind, Ethel embarked on a speaking tour. The French, surrounded by fascist states, Italy, Germany, and imminently Franco-Spain, were keen to hear what the anarchist journalist had to say. A struggle is taking place in Spain that should have the assistance of all decent-minded men and women in every part of the world. But what do we find? There is no united action to assist the proletariat of Spain in their struggle. Instead, we have a united front of socialist and communist parties with capitalism. The battle of a ragged band of raw recruits against a mechanized, highly trained army. Town after town falls to Franco with little resistance. Our victory is sure, because the Spanish proletariat have the will to conquer. Refugees scream out before Franco is advanced. From out of the fields of Andalusia and Asturias, fertilized by the blood of the heroic proletariat, will rise a new Spain of the proletariat. German planes, Italian planes bombed the city, and still Madrid held out. This was the Spanish Revolution, challenged into existence by insolent fascism. Madrid in a state of siege shows the effect of constant bombing by insurgent planes that fly over the Spanish capital by day and night. The workers of Spain rising to destroy Hitler, Mussolini and Franco. An official statement by the mayor of Barcelona, he has announced that the city has been raided from the air 23 times. The Spanish workers are holding the pass. They cannot hold it forever. Will you not rally to their assistance? Madrid calls. Barcelona calls. Your past calls. Workers of Britain, act. Anda, no me hables. Yo creo que lloré. Yo creo que lloré porque estaban, habían salido. Me daba asco de ver porque al principio, eh, cuando yo estaba trabajando en Solidaridad Obrera en, en la administración, y el martes, de, aquello fue tomado el jueves, y el martes el, el compañero administrador Nieves Núñez nos dice el que eso está perdido, el que quiera marchar sale un camión esa tarde, eh, de, en fin, de ahí, de Solidaridad Obrera, ¿no? Entonces yo llego a casa y le digo, nos vamos, nos vamos. Mi papá estaba muy acabado físicamente. Tenía, no tenía aún los 65 años, pero estaba muy acabado físicamente. Y mi papá dice, yo no me muevo. February the 27th, 1939, Britain and France recognized Franco's regime even before its final victory. March, Hitler and Mussolini lay down the foundations for their infamous Pact of Steel. April the 1st, the rebels proclaimed victory. Mi hermano había llevado a mi madre al cine los primeros días que entraron los nacionales. ¿eh? Y, y una vez quise ir yo. Dice, ah, y si yo vas a ir al cine vas a tener que levantar el brazo. Yo no voy a levantar el brazo. El brazo en alto. ¿sabes? Y resulta que vamos al cine y evidentemente no estaba lleno. ¿no? Era un cine barriado bastante grande. Y mi madre se levantó y tenía la mano así, y, y yo me daba risa, bueno, y me quedé sentada, no me levanté, pues hace creer que no sé cuántas butacas, hileras de butacas, había detrás de mí, en medio de todas las butacas, haga usted el favor de levantarse, si no me hubiera levantado, me meten en la cárcel, y allí, pues mira, y a mí me saltaron las lágrimas, y en allí me saltaron las lágrimas. The new ruler of Spain rides into the city of his conquest. Behind him is Moors, his army lines the route. The Moors and the light tanks come first, then the Italian Blackshirt Division. September 1939, Hitler invades Poland. The swastika spreads its curse over Europe, and Hitler has forced the world into a new war. There was a speculation 
to ask, what if the war in Spain had lasted that little bit longer? Would the Western powers then have been obliged to move in in defense of the Republic, despite the fact that, for example, the British government, the people in the British government, were much more sympathetic to Franco and the fascists than they were to the Republic? If you take a look at the Spanish Civil War, they had two phases. The first phase was a joint effort in different ways by fascists, communists, and liberal democracies to crush this beast of uh, freedom, of free people uh, running their own lives, seeking freedom and justice. That can't be tolerated. So they all collaborated in crushing that. And it was only kind of after that was taken care of that they went to war among each other in their own ways. Spain's civil war remained a fault line for the left throughout its bloody course and long after its conclusion. To this day, theorists and foot soldiers, members of political parties and individual thinkers tear apart, inspect, analyze, and look again at the revolution in Catalonia. Now, it's quite right, absolutely right, that anarchists who feel they were betrayed by certain elements of the Communist Party or Communist leadership in Spain, that they should feel angry. But at the same time, I think there's such a strong strand of, an of anti-communism running through the 20th century such a profound and deep strand that, that I think there's still the risk of, uh, uh, of witch hunts. Thank you, everyone, for welcoming me. Today, Spain is lost. I went to Spain full of hopes and dreams. It promised to be utopia realized. I return full of sadness, dulled by the tragedy I have seen. The aftermath, in many ways, was even more terrible than the war. More people died after the Civil War than died during the conflict. Because what followed after the end of the war was repression, revenge for their defying Franco and the rebellion. Despite all the forces that stand in our way, Working people of true heart and real bravery will continue to fight for justice and equality. The revolution will one day happen. The low rumble of an eruption beginning deep down will eventually burst. It may take a decade or less. It may take a century or more. But come it will. Whenever you have a period of an upsurge of activism, say the 1960s, or today, for that matter. Uh, you find anarchist strains all over. The human spirit will not allow itself to be squashed and imprisoned forever. I mean, 70 years after the Spanish Civil War, I look around the world and what I see is that you know, the, the spirit of resistance and rebellion, the desire for change is as, is as vibrant and real and immediate as ever it was. Capitalists, communists, no matter how they try to suppress us, the people will run out of patience with them. There are the beginnings, for the first time, of uh, a real uh, popular movement uh, questioning the right of existence of corporations. I mean, those are the major institution of the 20th century. Capitalism no se justifica a sí mismo, y el, ni la ambición del dinero, ni la ambición del poder. Spain and the Spanish Civil War is part of the history of a living movement, which is rises and falls over time. Lo que queremos es avanzar. The resistance continues, the movement grows. It's a new movement, different faces, but the same spirit. Pese a lo que les pose, nuestra verdad la seguiremos diciendo, y por eso existimos, y por eso sigue existiendo otras organizaciones menos preponderantes que lo era antes, pero que siguen hablando en nombre de esa libertad y en nombre de esos ideales. No nos entierren, no hemos muerto. Hay juventud que continúa en la brecha. English-speaking workers, why are you sleeping while your Spanish brothers and sisters are being murdered? Where are your traditions? Speak, act.